everyone, Nico on here from the Hyperactive Bookworm. I did previously do an introduction to this interview, but when I went to edit it, I discovered that for some reason it had been muted and that made it really not helpful. Um, so the following video you're going to see is an interview I had with the incredible and amazing Lee Winter. So normally I do do the introduction with the author, I was way too nervous and I got straight into the questions and yeah so that was that was just me being completely fangirly and you know it was one of the best interviews I've had I had so much fun chatting with Lee she was so encouraging and supportive and it was so lovely. She was so kind in answering some really out there questions that I asked her. We did also get to discuss her um, upcoming books that will be coming out in January and February. So definitely go have a look and check them out. They are amazing. And yeah, I really hope you enjoy this interview because I absolutely adored getting to talk to Lay. All right. Thanks, y'all. First question. Are you able to sit in silence for extended periods of time? If so, is your mind loud with thoughts and ideas? One, yes, absolutely. I love solitude. Absolutely love it. It's almost my preferred state. <laughs> um, yeah, my mind's always filled with stuff. I've got dozens and dozens of ideas going at any given time. I like that. Do you work on more than one idea at a time or you uh, have to work on one idea and move on from it? Uh, I have one primary idea, but I have a few nipping at my heels, begging to be heard. And um, yeah, I have to, what do you call it, stress test ideas before I start writing a book. And that just means pulling it apart and thinking about it constantly until I'm convinced I've got a book length idea. Every now and then I have failed and thought, yeah, this is a book. It's got legs and started and realized, no, it doesn't. Oh, and no. pulled out. And that's happened to me. Well, once, once in a major way where I did all the research, got two weeks in, had the beta readers, everything lined up and then just, no, you know what? I said to myself, I don't even like these people. Why am I writing a whole book about them? <laughs> so that was oh, that. gosh. Yeah. So, you know, but most of the time, Stress, stress testing and everything um it's fine and away i go wow i couldn't imagine putting that much work in and just being like nah don't like them that's well, the way i see it though is that i actually save myself a lot of work by knowing within only two weeks that it wasn't going to go i mean imagine if i legitimately started getting into it that would have been awful absolutely awful Very i mean true. there's two books two books of mine i have stopped writing not because I didn't think it had legs, but because I was too exhausted or too whatever to continue. One was Hotel Queens, which took 18 months because oh, I stopped wow. and did a book in the middle. Well, I stopped and did changing the script and dropped them in the middle because I was just so run down. And it was just such a big plot and there was so much happening. And I thought, oh, I just, my brain, my brain can't cope. So I came back to it, happy that I did. And the yeah. other one, uh, what was the other one? Oh, the one that I'm going to be writing next. Which um, is Vengeance Planning for Amateurs, which I'd done all the research on. It was ready to go. I'd written about two chapters and I came across a plot hole that I just couldn't figure out. So I went, you know, what? I'll just put that aside and I wrote The Awkward Truth instead. But I'm going back to that. Wow. It's all fine. Oh, and I also wrote Chaos Agent of the Fixer instead as well. But, you know, I'm going back to, that's my next book. That's my next book. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Um, okay, so what's the most disgusting thing you've ever had to eat? I am very picky with my food, so there's a lot of things on that list. Um, I really, I remember being absolutely traumatised as a little girl in New Zealand and being fed white bait fritters, which are these little white, uh, squiggly little tadpole looking things. And they've got black eyeballs, right? So when they're in a fritter, you just see a whole row of eyeballs looking up at you. So I was very traumatized by this. I just like, once I realized I was looking at little fish eyes, like looking up at me, looking sad, I was just like, oh my God, 
they're all heathens. So yeah, that's oh my the god, one that, that I remember does being. sound traumatic. Thank you. Yes, it did. And that's... yet, it's New Zealand specialty. God knows really? why. It tastes shit. <laughs> oh my god! Pardon my language. Pardon my French. Language, language. Anyone who watches this knows that I'm an Aussie and language is, you know, a love language. I'm sure of it. Um, okay. What's one thing you were certain you would be when you were older that you are really glad you never became? That's a great question. Um, you know, when I was young, growing up, like I finished school in 86, I thought I was going to be closeted for life. Oh, so I thought I'd be a closet job forever and I'm really glad the world changed and I stopped being so afraid but yeah I, I did I think I would be a closeted gay woman forever wow I'm really glad that you know the world did change and you didn't have to carry on with that like longer yeah, yeah. it's hard to explain to the world to, to younger people now what it felt like it really was very repressed Everyone was very afraid. It did actually cost people jobs and things. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just like, I'm gay, you know, ooh, and it's not a really big deal. But it really was back then. I was I was just so afraid. So when you say 86, that's graduating high school or graduating? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I was yeah, I was 16 and 86. So, yeah, I just finished high school. And stepping out to the workforce, I thought, some people think leaving school, that's it. That's great. They're left behind all the bullshit mm -hmm. and that the real and no i was just convinced the workplace was going to be an extension and it was just going to be more of the same yeah that would have been terrifying like it, it was hard enough even when you know i finished high school and all that stuff and i had it very easy um with the whole coming out situation but even then like the world was not as it is now no. And it is really hard. Like my my um nieces and nephews just can't even understand some of the the stories that I have to tell them. They're like, "What?" I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. "Yeah." And, and it was like internalized homophobia too. Like I remember yes. in about '89, someone the very first time I heard someone talk about same sex marriage, mm. and my first words out of my mouth, and I wasn't saying it because I thought I was in a hostile environment. I literally said, "That's ridiculous." <laughs> Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it's so ingrained going, Why? Is it, it was the first time I'd never heard of, I'd never heard anyone propose it before in America had started talking about it. And I was just like, what? That's ridiculous. And that's yeah. the world we were living in. That was ridiculous. And now it's Absolutely. not ridiculous. Now it's just wonderful. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's so, it was such a, yeah, just mind blowing time when we finally got it in australia it, it was just yeah. i didn't even let myself hope that it would ever be legalized in my lifetime basically same yeah and it was just so amazing that it happened it was yeah. just fantastic i um, just mapped the whole progress based on the face of penny wong who's an australian yes. senator who's gay and very hot but anyway yes so indeed. She, she's very <laughs> stoic she's so stoic but on the day that it passed, her breaking down was just like everyone just broke down at the same time. It was very emotional. Yes. I was uh, so happy. I know. It was just, I think I cried for like three days just from relief from it all. Just, yeah. just you know, one step closer. And I mean, we have, you know, further to go, obviously, but such a big step closer. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. So when you achieve a goal, do you have another goal like ready and waiting or do you pivot, make new goals once a goal is achieved? No, I always pretty much know where I'm going oh, man. because of all those ideas. No, because, you know, yeah. I say I've got these ideas like nipping at my heels. Well, then mm. when I've gotten rid of the bigger one, one of the little ones comes, comes up, rises to the fore. So I always have a pretty good idea where I'm heading. Oh, that's cool. Generally. Yeah, I get that. I don't think there's many authors I've actually spoken to who don't already sort of have these voices in the background going, yeah. pick the next, pick the next. So that absolutely yeah. makes sense. 
Um, mm. I've seen artwork of your characters and Facebook Facebook profiles that people have made of them. What's the single most surprising thing a reader has ever done in relation to your writing? Huh. Well, another good question. Very good name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well I, I think the um i don't think anyone's done this before maybe they have and i didn't know but the the growth of my characters suddenly appearing on facebook as their own characters as brought to life by readers that i've had nothing to do with people sometimes think it's me being eleanor bartell on facebook and felicity simmons and all of that yeah. i'm not it's not <laughs> They're readers who've just like suddenly appeared and made their own Facebook page in the name of my characters and away they've gone. And I love it. It's I've so found out subsequently. Yeah, I found out subsequently who they are. <laughs> and they're wonderful, by the way. They're absolutely Excellent. wonderful people. And then, but I love how they've nailed the characterization so well. It's really they impressive. Have. They have. I Every time I see them in there, it absolutely cracks me up. Because you could actually believe it is Elena Bartel. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. And, um, you know, sometimes I have to, you know, say yes, ma'am and no, ma'am, because I don't want to offend Eleanor, which is yeah. kind of crazy. Because you, <laughs> you created her. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's just hilarious to watch. Um, it's so much fun. <laughs> okay, so th this is one that um, people may not, be aware of where this question comes from but I'll explain it afterward <laughs> okay what's your opinion of practical jokes and how were you convinced to, to cable tie requiem for immortals that you sent to me well that's a different thing um well basically a reader approached me and then begged and then begged some more a little <laughs> unconvinced to cable tie a book I was sending to you and like literally lots and lots of what was it about 50 cable ties or something yes. that you had to open to get into it um i don't really see that as a practical joke i just think that's a sight gag okay actual practical jokes i'm really not a fan of if, if anyone's getting hurt i'm yeah. just a bit squeamish about hurt feelings i don't want people to feel bad but i didn't think you'd feel bad so that was fine i thought you'd just laugh which oh, you kind did, did. <laughs> yeah. it was hilarious um yeah, I actually did do a video of it for anyone who hasn't watched it of me um, unwrapping it. And I don't think I, I spoke for half the time. I was just cracking up laughing too much. <laughs> <laughs> what was your biggest fear when you first decided to write fiction? Because I know you started in journalism. Journalism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that it would be no good. See, I always thought that authors were like special people, like special, oh. super duper talented over there people, people who are like high up oh. on that hill. And I was way down the bottom in the foothills. And it was just, I felt like the gap between them and me was huge. So I started writing thinking, who, who would want to read this? And then a very funny thing happened after I had submitted the Red Files my editor at the time, who was Jove Bell, Bell, yeah, Jove, um, got me on a Skype call. And then basically, I think Sandra G J was there as well, yep. and basically said these words to me, <clears throat> listen to me, Lee, you've got to write books. You have got to write books. And I was like, well, I did just write, but no, you've got to. <laughs> it was a very funny conversation. And I got from that, she was saying that she enjoyed the book and thought it was <laughs> worthy of, you know, pursuing that I wasn't just some hack. And that was really, that was uplifting. It made me keep writing. Wow. I, I don't know why, but it sort of had this idea that you would be less, no, how do I phrase that? More immune to that whole self-doubt thing with having written so much mm. in no, I mean, I know what you're saying. Imposter syndrome is definitely a thing, but I didn't really have it so much as, I mean, I knew I could write nonfiction. Yeah. I had a particular, I mean, I won awards for nonfiction writing. I was a very good journalist. I, that wasn't the issue. It was like, how do you take something nonfiction-y, a skill, and then turn it into fiction? 
in a way that is engaging. I didn't know if I could engage the reader of fictional books the way I could newspaper articles and freelance, oh, sorry, um, feature articles. And then when Jove said to me, listen to me, Lee, yep, you've got to done. write books. <laughs> I realized, oh, okay, I did that, check. And yeah. after that, I didn't do I just didn't know because there was a knowledge gap. You just don't know. And bear yeah. in mind, up until that point, I had not been reading any less fix. So I didn't know what the standard was. I didn't know where I fit in, how I slotted in, if I was down the bottom or up the top or in, right. you know. So that was actually really nice of Jove, you know. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And I, I, I can imagine it would be hard if you've not read any of it to sort of kind of be able to gauge where you could possibly fit within it. Yeah, I mean, now looking back, I can see that <laughs> it was a very different book in that it didn't do most of the tropes and things you're supposed to do mm. in, I mean, a lot of people who don't read lesbian they don't realize you're supposed to do all these things and have the breakup. Oh, I did have the breakup of 80% or whatever, but you know yeah. what I mean? There's these unwritten rules and I didn't know what yeah. any of the rules yeah. were. So I wasn't really sticking to them at all. I was just writing whatever and it worked out. But subsequently having read a lot of books, I see the patterns and what we're supposed to do. And I also see some people getting annoyed with reading these same things over and over, which is why the books that don't do that stand out. They do. They absolutely do. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I can't help but think, yeah, but maybe that's a good thing you didn't know all the tropes. <laughs> or the yeah. or the, you know, the hitting all the beats and that type of thing. Yeah, it it frees you up a lot more if you don't know that you're supposed to be sticking to rules. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. You know, what I, know, you know, know. That I haven't really stuck to rules much either no. since. No, but I think that's absolutely worked in your favour. Thank you. I mean, not always. Shattered, let I remind you, the ending of Shattered got a lot of people very upset. But I have to point out, it was not a romance, people. That book is, I mean, come on. How many times do I have to say? That book is the freaking best book ever. People ask me, like, on all those lists and stuff, you know, your favourite book. It, it's always there. It is my absolute favourite book. I need to get another copy because I've destroyed my current copy. Um, but yeah, it was it was a polarizing book though. People who expect a certain really? type of happy happy ending. I think Shadow has a happy ending. It's so just not I. the one that people expect to see. They expect to see a couple who are getting closer and closer throughout the book to be together at the end. Yeah, and if they find their happiness in different ways because they have formed a friendship and they then go separately mm -hmm. and they have this love for this other person who helped them along their way, a platonic love, I still think that's happy. But there are a lot of people who yeah. got hit between the eyeballs and went, that is not what I wanted. I did not like that ending. Oh, my God. Oh and my it gosh. was really interesting. It was really, really interesting seeing how that polarised people in time, in the fullness of time, and the fact that I bang on and on about the fact that nothing <laughs> of romance, uh, people have you know, rediscovered it and don't have those expectations and, and that's yeah. been fine. I have discovered the secret to having a good response to any book is managing expectations. And as long as people get what they expect to get, everyone's fine with you. Yeah, very true. Very true. As long as you, you let them know, you know, they're not yeah. going to get the standard here. Um, I absolutely love Shattered. It, you know, I know, comes as a shock, doesn't it, really? Um, but I think the ending's the most uplifting, happiest ending because their friendship is so much more. Like, it's just so beautiful and amazing. And that's what people in your life are. Not every, not every person that can really affect and, and turn your life is going to be, like, a sexual partner. So... That's true. And sometimes you meet people in your life and you find out you're better as friends. Yeah. And sometimes you meet people in life and they're only supposed to be in your life, a little, little way to guide you here or there. But, you know, these are, these are no less valid than long-term romantic relationships. Yes. And exactly. I wanted to celebrate that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the many, many things I love about that book. It's absolutely fantastic. I think it's just amazing. Um, have you ever been contacted by a reader thinking you were Lee Winters, the children's author? 
Uh, <laughs> Lee Winter. There is a Lee Winter without the S children author. Um, her name, which <laughs> we both began our writing careers at exactly the same month. Oh. And she contacted me. She was a little bit hostile oh. and said, what are we going to do about this? And I said, well, I'm not changing my name. And yeah. she was getting very, very angsty about the thought that people might be buying my racy lesbian books um, and thinking they're buying her books. Oh, dear. And I said, who on earth, on God's green earth, doesn't read a blue before they buy a book? And she was, no, she was very insane. I said, well, here's a choice. You can change your name. Why don't you put your initial or, or put up your photo or something? So in the end, she did both because she didn't have her photo up at the time. And I have never had a single person, not one, mistake my books for children's books for well, some reason. The, the covers will pretty much tell you. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about your house being turned into a nature documentary? Uh, I don't mind. I mean, it's very pretty when you get up in the morning and yawn and stretch and you walk out to the kitchen and look out the window and you go, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> nice. Five types of parrots hanging upside down and eating your birds. So <laughs> that's pretty good. But, you know. She does, she being Sam, does steal all my organic fruit and feed the animals with it and, you know. When she broke her arm very badly and was um, off feeding duties for almost a year um, and the duties fell to me, I know there was a drop in clientele. I know they were very disappointed in the lack of filtered water and so forth. So I'm sure they're very glad she's back at it. Oh, wow. A whole year, that would have been... Yeah, it was a very bad break. Oh, she was not good. That's not good. Well, I, I assume she's okay now, though. Yeah, yeah. She's oh. fine. The birds are happy. The lizards are happy and the quenders are happy. So, you know, apparently that's all that matters out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to the I, <laughs> I love it. So this question um, probably will come a little bit out of left field. But I have seen through um, social media that you don't drink coffee, you don't drink alcohol, and you have very interesting turns of phrases. And for me, and you've recently put something else up that you've said you're very you're you're not at all religious, but from a little ex moment, it just rings really weird was there is there a religious type reasoning for those not being in your life no <laughs> it's quite the opposite okay so my dad was an absolute cheapskate right uh, yeah. so he used to brew his own beer oh, but the problem was i don't know if you've ever smelled brewing hops but it's the most revolting smell yeah. on god's green earth. it is disgusting the house would reek of it my brother and i neither of us drink any alcohol because of these formative experiences when he wasn't brewing hops and making putting us off beer for life he was brewing his own making his own wine and he was just not that skilled shall we say and every now and then you'd walk into the garage and the bloody explode these bottles would just like explode because. it's like tiptoeing through a minefield anyway that wasn't quite why i was off wine i mean i actually have an allergic reaction i am elizabeth thornton in the sense that my throat will close over if i have wine something to do with histamine my mother had the same problem oh wow and spirits i don't mind spirits but i do get a bit uh, sloppy and <laughs> achy and a bit too let me tell everyone my secrets i just saw no need to continue <laughs> this ridiculous experiment in alcohol given all the you know attended woes and i don't drink tea or coffee never really got the habit i used to drink pepsi like it was going out of style pepsi max but sam has convinced me of the evils of aspartame so now i'm on very very boring like faintly flavored fizzy water it's just <laughs> it's tragic you know honestly honestly if i could smuggle pepsi max here right now i would i would so do it <laughs> did you want to um promote your next two books your, your next two books yes i keep thinking of them as one book well i do too it's one story in two books called the fixer is book one and chaos agent is book two and they tell the story or the it's the redemption of the villain from the red files and under your skin universe her name is michelle hastings yes 
She treated Catherine Ayres very badly, very, very badly. And I always thought that was it, no more. She's gone from my life. And then um, Sliced Ice came out, and that was my collection of short stories and anthology. And Angela Daw, blessed legend that she is, read it. And I just can't put my finger on it, but the way she read Michelle Hastings, I just sat bolt up in my chair and I thought, I have got to know this woman's story. So it all came to me. It was very, you know, clear what happened. So the first book is, the other character is Eden Lawless. And she's a hippie, la la, protester, liberal, everything you could care to name. Her mother is a famous eco warrior. She's just, she has never met a protest she doesn't love. And right. so she. Can I just stop you there? Lawless. Is that intentional? Yeah, there's a okay. joke in there about Xena, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Character. It just it just seemed to fit. Absolutely, anyway, so... especially the eco warrior going in there, loving it. So she gets this uh, email from this mysterious company asking for a meeting to help them out with some assignment because she's a freelancer, so she'll take jobs and all sorts. And she's asked to help this mob. She doesn't know what they're called, but they're, they're fixers, which Michelle is CEO of. She's asked to go to a small town and unseat their corrupt mayor. Now, the small town is her own hometown, so she's very invested because this is a mayor who ran her out of town. Oh. So she has a vested interest, a reason to want to take the assignment. And she has to come up with a really creative way to do it because you see the media and the police in that town are on the mayor's side and they are bent, they are corrupt. So how do you bring down a mayor who's up for re-election without the media being oh. in any way interested in telling any story that's negative about the mayor? So she has to come up with a way to figure that out. In doing that, she does a, such a good job. Book two, she's now working for Michelle full time. And that's a whole other bag because Michelle has never told her what she does at the fixes. She doesn't, poor Eden doesn't know it's an evil organization that's dedicated to fulfilling the whims of the rich and the famous and the corrupt and the dirty and every little secret. And it's just, it's, it's, it's awful, this organization. And here's sweet Eden Lawless, little panda bear, working for the snakes and the sharks, and she doesn't know it. So you can oh, imagine God. how that book goes. And that is Chaos Agent. Chaos Agent is a reference to uh, Eden Lawless inside the fixes. And they don't know what hit them. You'd think that the snakes and the sharks would take down Eden. Ha! Eden changes <laughs> the snakes and the sharks. It's so, it was so much fun to write. I swear it was just a delight to write. Oh, I can't so wait to That's read coming up. So January is Chaos Agent. Uh, sorry, January is the fixer. At the end of January, two weeks later, is uh, Chaos Agent and deliberately close together so people don't have to wait too long to find out <laughs> what the hell happens. God, it was a fun read and Michelle redeems herself. She does. Oh, I'm so I didn't interested even think in it was seeing possible. that. Didn't even think it was possible, but yeah. No. My two beta readers, or oh, actually four in the end when you include the sensitive, they all agree she redeemed herself, but boy, I made her work for it. That's why it had to be two books. You can't redeem someone in one book. Not with what she's done. No, not with her history. Oh. No. Like, yeah. I'm so interested course, to see how it how it pans out because you yeah. make really really good bad guys, people you really dislike. I do like a good villain. Mm. I do. This but book yeah. is chock a block full of villains. It's got so many villains. And you just never know quite whose side everyone's on until the end. Yeah. This is a funny story. Astrid, my publisher, when she got to the big reveal in book two as to who was villaining, apparently yeah. ran through the office and in English, because she's German, English shouted, Lee Winter is a fucking legend, which I thought was great. <laughs> I did ask her later why she didn't scream that in German, and she just says it sounds better in English, so I'm not going to argue. So. <laughs> oh, that's, that's definite high praise then. Wow, I cannot wait to read these. Yeah, it's so cool. And of course, just out as in today, but it won't be today when this comes out, um, is the ultimate boss set, which is the brutal truth, yes. the awkward truth, and three short stories. So that's just a cool ebook that if you want all your books in the truth universe in one box set, that's it. That's very cool. 
All right. Thank you so much, Lee, for joining us today and for answering the, the random questions that I've thrown at you. Um, for people who are watching, where is the best place for them to find all things Lee Winter? Well, I've got a website, leewinterauthor.com, and I'm all over social media. Usually my tag is Lee Winter Oz. So you can find me on um, Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, uh, Mastodon, <laughs> Instagram. Um, and I'm also on Pinterest, but for some reason I'm Lee Winter Author there, not Lee Winter Oz, but you know. Just hey, to... I just don't know what I was thinking, honestly, people. Here's <laughs> advice to new authors. If you're gonna be an author, keep the same username for every handle, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> later. Sometimes it's easier, easier said than done. Uh, yeah. I will make sure I put your website down in the comments on the video as well. That'd be great. Thank you. No worries. And Thanks again, for thank having you. me. Uh, thank you for asking such interesting questions. I will be oh. pondering those for days. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, Dean. Have a good one. You too. <laughs> okay. Hey, it's me again, Nin Cohen, aka the Hyperactive Bookworm. I love being able to talk about books and writing and reading, and I love doing these. However, it does take me time and energy and any support would be highly appreciated. If you like the videos, please don't be scared to hit like or to comment on them. Um, all subscribers help toward keeping my passion projects going. Um, you can also support me by buying me a coffee and the links down below. Thanks, y'all.